HDL cholesterol. <coughs> when we talk about the non-HDL cholesterol, the question that arises is this, should it be the primary target in the current scenario? What is the evidence and uh, whether it is going to be really important in our clinical practice? All of us know that atherosclerosis is a preventable disorder. The lipids, the lipoproteins are associated with atherosclerosis in general and coronary atherosclerosis in particular. Out of all the lipids, it is LDL cholesterol that plays an important role or a central role or the pivotal role not only in the initiation of atherosclerosis but also in the progression of atherosclerosis not only in the initiation of atherosclerosis but also in the progression of atherosclerosis ending in clinical cardiovascular events like acute coronary syndrome or sudden cardiac death. We have robust evidence about the role played by the LDL cholesterol. In fact, we have observational data, we have epidemiological information, we have molecular biological data to talk about the role played by LDL cholesterol. But if you look at the evidence that is available with us is a randomized control trials which has got robust evidence. By using HMG coenzyme A reductase inhibitor statin in the management of lipids which had produced a marked reduction of LDL cholesterol at the same time you have a cardiovascular benefit in the form of reduction in cardiovascular morbidity as well as mortality. If you would like to tell about the role played by LDL cholesterol, the best one, the best example will be only familial hypercholesterolemia. Persons with a familial hypercholesterolemia commonly develop the premature atherosclerosis and clinical atherosclerotic cardiovascular events even in the absence of other risk factors. Not necessary that one should have hypertension or diabetes or smoking or obesity or insulin resistant syndrome to have a premature atherosclerosis except to have only one problem that is a genetic preponderance to develop a problem of LDL cholesterol abnormality that pushes these patients for a premature coronary event. No other risk factor can do the same. So the primary focus in the prevention of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease it must be only on lowering LDL cholesterol and keeping it low throughout our life. Let us look at the pathogenesis of atherosclerosis. In simple terms, I would like to draw your attention mainly to one important information that LDL accounts for more than 75% of the atherosclerotic lipoprotein. You need to remember the rest of the contribution for atherosclerosis is actually by tigrisate rich lipoprotein particles. This plays a very important role or a larger role when triglycerides are elevated. The VLDL triglyceride or the cholesterol is enriched with atherogenic potential properties. It is the most atherogenic form of VLDL that is a degraded products of VLDL which we call as the remnants. They are considered to be more atherogenic. The atherogenic component of atherosclerosis is only the small part of the cholesterol and not its triglyceride that need to remember. But the importance of VLDL as an atherogenic particle is always in association with an increased levels of triglyceride. Let me now take you to the Indian scenario on lipids and lipoproteins. There is an excellent epidemiological study by Rajiv Gupta and his group from Jaipur which has been consistently publishing this data on Indian Heart Fast study which had clearly mentioned about the pattern of dyslipidemia in our country. They had recruited nearly 6,400 patients. The age adjusted prevalence percentage is depicted here. You can see that the predominant abnormality in the lipids is abnormal higher levels of triglyceride and abnormal lower levels of HDL cholesterol. If you look at the slide, you will be surprised to see nearly 44.1% of males were seemed to be suffering from higher levels of triglyceride when compared to females in whom 
it is 33.6. Whereas the HDL cholesterol, lower levels of HDL cholesterol was predominantly seen in women taking the figures to 35.1% when compared to only 31.8% in males. Now look at the other abnormality. What about the LDL cholesterol? Very, very rare to see people above 130 milligrams of LDL cholesterol in this population-based study where you get only 17.8% in males and 15.2% in females. Whereas people in whom the LDL cholesterol is between 100 to 139, probably around 48.5% in males and 37.4% in females. That is a scenario. So our people, our population have only marginal elevation of LDL cholesterol, but the predominant abnormality is a high triglyceride and low HDL. There is an excellent study which was done particularly in people with diabetes by Parekh Dendona, which was published in the year 2010. In people with diabetes, particularly males, the abnormalities of dyslipids, the dyslipidemia is to the extent of 85.5% and in females it is about 97.8%. In fact, the investigators of this particular study had come to a conclusion saying that 9 out of 10 people in India with diabetes or seem to be suffering from dyslipidemia. That's an alarming figure of an association of an abnormality of lipids in people with diabetes. The most recent data that was published by Mohan and his group, the study was conducted in four states, one in Tamil Nadu, two in Maharashtra, the third was in Chandigarh, and the fourth one was in Jargon. These people have recruited a number of subjects in this study. Nearly about 2,042 people were recruited particularly for the analysis of lipoprotein. Every fourth or the fifth patient who were recruited for the study were analyzed for their lipid abnormalities. You will be surprised to see that dyslipidemia percentage is about 79% in this population based study. Number two is hypertriglyceridemia is about 29.5%. What is attracting our attention here is the lower levels of HDL cholesterol which is around 72.3%. The problem here is to see that there is always an overlap between the triglyceride and the HDL cholesterol. And the most recent study that was published by Prakash Didvania and again Dr. Rajiv Gupta from Jaipur, this is an excellent study to detect the prevalence of metabolic syndrome in our country, particularly in urban population these people have done the study. It is a multi-center study. And you will be surprised to see that nearly about 40% of females and 33% of men were found to be suffering from the so-called metabolic syndrome with a lot of constellation of risk factors. The predominant abnormality in this particular study is a high levels of triglyceride and low levels of HDL. Again, High levels of triglyceride were predominantly seen in men when compared to women and the lower levels of HDL was predominantly seen in women when compared to men. Taking the figures to 52.8% of women with low levels of HDL cholesterol when compared to 34 in men and 41% in males with the hypertriglyceridemia when compared to only 31% in females. Almost correlating with the Indian heart watch study. The residual risk lipid lowering, all of you know that we have seen any number of studies. The lipid lowering studies using statins in primary prevention studies, secondary prevention studies, lipid lowering therapy in high risk group. If you analyze all the data, you will be surprised to see that nearly about 55 to 70 percent of the patients are still at a high risk of developing a cardiovascular event in spite of the fact that these people received either adequate dose statin or a high dose statin. You need to remember that important information. What does it tell you? In spite of the fact that these people had received statin, they are still at a high risk of developing cardiovascular event. What does it mean? You need to probably concentrate on LDL further for a further reduction of LDL or you need to move away from LDL and try to concentrate on HDL cholesterol 
I think most of us had wasted our time nearly about one and a half decades only on concentration with the HDL raising, raising, raising. And ultimately we failed to raise the HDL cholesterol. In spite of raising it also, we did not get any cardiovascular benefit. The next thing what you should remember is to concentrate only on non-HDL, which we had totally forgotten. In spite of the fact that in 2001, when the NCEP ATP3 guidelines were published, it is clearly recommended in people in whom, if you have reached the LDL cholesterol, you need to look at the triglyceride. If it is more than 200 milligrams, you need to concentrate on non-HDL cholesterol reduction. That was the message that was given by the NCEP ATP3 in the year 2001. I think we wasted nearly 13 years to recognize that non-HDL cholesterol is the most important parameter. The next thing again these people have advised through the National Lipid Association guidelines is that it is a secondary target, which is a secondary target, metabolic syndrome with a constellation of risk factors, which is very common even in our country, not only in US, nearly 33% of the population in the United States suffers or suffering from metabolic syndrome. It is also equally true even in our country that the increasing prevalence of metabolic syndrome is identified. Okay, what is the abnormality that you see in metabolic syndrome as far as the lipid is concerned? One is the VLDL. Look at, compared to the normal people, you can see people with insulin resistance have more number of VLDL triglycerides and their APOB content is also very high. What about the LDL? The LDL particles in normal people are larger, buoyant cholesterol LDL. Whereas in people with insulin resistance, they are all smaller particles and more in number and the APOB content is also high. The third important point is that the HDL cholesterol actually which contains the anti-atherogenic moiety that is APOA1 in fact no, comes down in number. So the HDL APOA1 anti-atherogenic property comes down, the HDL particle number comes down and the particle size also comes down. This is a typical pattern what is normally seen in insulin resistance or in metabolic syndrome, which we call as atherogenic dyslipidemia. Now, let me now take you to this non-HDL cholesterol, a beautiful figure, which will give you an idea about the non-HDL cholesterol. The HDL cholesterol, you can just see, which has got an APOA1, which is anti-atherogenic. Forget about HDL because it is anti-atherogenic. The rest of the things, what is seen on this side, are all atherogenic particles. Please remember that. We are not going away from LDL, we are still catching LDL and taking to another level where you can have VLDL, you can have IDL, you can have lipoprotein little a, you can have the chylomicron remnants, everything clubbed together. You call this as a, with a specific terminology that is non-HDL cholesterol, which has gained a lot of importance in the recent past. We need to concentrate on this because the upper B is also seen in all atherogenic particles. Upper B100 is predominantly seen in every particle except the chylomicron where you get upper B48. So that is about the composition of what we call as a non-HDL cholesterol. There are any number of studies to talk about this parameter of non-HDL cholesterol and its implication in increasing the cardiovascular risk. The most important study, what I thought I should probably request your attention here is this particular study. Within the non-HDL cholesterol, if you look at the various levels of LDL cholesterol horizontally, you don't get any increase in the cardiovascular risk. Whereas you look at this within the non-HDL cholesterol with every parameter, you can get in the perpendicular direction, there is an increase in the cardiovascular risk. So non-HDL cholesterol is a very strong predictor of cardiovascular risk when compared to LDL. This is an elegant data that was published. And not only that, again a recent study in the year 2008 I clearly mentioned about the problem of non-HDL cholesterol and its cardiovascular risk. In patients in whom you have less than 100 milligrams of LDL with the therapy, particularly in the TNT study which is called a treat to new target, in people with the chronic stable angina, this trial was conducted. Ideal study again in angina patients, it was conducted. And it was found that the non-HDL cholesterol, but not the LDL cholesterol, 
as a significant predictor of major cardiovascular events. This is the most important meta-analysis, which had involved nearly eight trials. People had taken into consideration right from 1994 to 2008 all the studies, the robust studies, nearly eight studies, and they had analyzed the data. This, the information that is projected here is very, very important. One standard deviation increase in LDL cholesterol can increase in the coronary artery disease risk by about 13%. Whereas one standard deviation up or B increases the cardiovascular events by about 14%. The same one standard deviation increase in the non-HDL cholesterol increases the cardiovascular events by 16%. It is obvious. So, one standard deviation when it is increasing 16%, which is important. So, non HDL cholesterol is most important than the other one. So, strength of association with the cardiovascular disease is greater for non HDL than for LDL or for APOB. The same study, we also got another information. Look at this data. The particularly people in whom you have already reached the non HDL cholesterol less than 130. But the LDL cholesterol is high. What is that? The value is more than 100. So people in whom you have already reached the non-HDL cholesterol below the goal, but LDL cholesterol is still high. What is the risk that you are going to get? The hazard ratio is about 0 0.2, 0 0.02, which indicates nearly about 2% risk. Whereas look at the other group of patients in whom you have the abnormalities in the form of LDL cholesterol has already reached less than 100, whereas the non-HDL cholesterol is more than 130. What does it mean? The hazard ratio is about 1.32, which indicates nearly 32% increase in cardiovascular risk. This clearly tells you this information. What is that information? The strength of association is very important. Among statin-treated patients, the non-HDL cholesterol is associated with an increased risk of future events, even if LDL is under control. The same study also had given us another information because in 2012, we also had another publication from American Journal of Cardiology, where there is a meta-analysis which was conducted, taking into consideration nearly 25 trials, not 8 trials, 25 trials, and nearly 130,000 patients. 130,000 patients were actually analyzed and the data clearly shows the non-HDL cholesterol outperforms the APOB for the prediction of cardiovascular disease. After seeing all these reports, in 2012, American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists started giving this information. What is that? Calculate the non-HDL cholesterol in people with diabetes. Calculate non HDL cholesterol in people with established coronary artery disease. And that gives you most important data, particularly when the triglyceride levels are more than 200 and less than 500. It is very, very important information. The second one, in people in whom you suspect strongly the insulin resistance, if you are analyzing the non HDL cholesterol, calculating the non HDL cholesterol, this will give useful information for total atherogenic lipid burden. After getting all this information in 2013, to our surprise, the ACC AHA guidelines which were published in the November month in 2013 was give, started giving sort of information for us, which is totally disappointing. These investigators, the guideline developers, were unable to find RCT evidence to support the continued use of LDL under non-HDL treatment targets. Use of lipid lowering drugs other than statin is discouraged. Only statins have data for CV protection. Non-statin drugs have no evidence of CV protection. So that was information. In fact, after the publication of ACC AHA guidelines in 2013, there are a lot of criticism which started appearing in various journals. All of you would have probably, some of you would have seen it also. Lot of criticism. Probably that is applicable only for certain group of uh, in Americans, not for everybody, even in the United States. In fact, the calculator watch these people were promoting 
is useless calculator, outmoded data. Even Ritker started commenting on this particular calculator. They analyzed it and they found nearly about 12.8 million older adults in the United States will be under the umbrella of statin if you are using this calculator. Think about our own country if you are going to use this calculator and identify people who are at risk. That's all. You need to put everybody on statin, everybody on statin. So that is the, the, the grave situation as far as the, the academic body's recommendation is concerned. On HDL cholesterol, all of us know it's the traditional primary target for clinical intervention. Non-HDL is an appropriate target for clinical intervention. What is atherogenic cholesterol? It can be LDL or it can be non-HDL. Anyway, LDL is a traditional primary target because many national guidelines are still sticking on to that. Non-HDL is now increasingly preferred as a target of therapy. LDL plus VLDL is non-HDL. You don't require any specific biochemical parameters to assess this. You need to probably depend only on your simple calculation, total cholesterol minus HDL cholesterol. You get a value that is non-HDL cholesterol. If you do this non-HDL cholesterol by calculation, you need not get worried about the increase in the triglycerides also. It subsumes the impact of elevated triglycerides. There is a growing evidence that it is more predictive when compared to LDL, essentially equivalent to lipoprotein B. In case you have a high-risk patient, what should be the level of LDL? High-risk patient means less than 70 milligram LDL. The non-HDL should be less than 100. 30 milligram more than that of LDL is considered as a goal for non-HDL. Most of our patients with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, they require maximal statin therapy and that has to be instituted and should be continued as long as they can tolerate. In case you are not able to achieve the so-called 70 milligram because the baseline LDL cholesterol values are very high before starting the therapy, you may not reach 70. There is one study which started indicating nearly 40% of the people are not achieving the 70 milligrams of LDL cholesterol. How are you going to do that? You need to probably combine with other drugs also. Maybe acetamide, maybe a good additional agent which will serve the purpose. Bile acid sequestrant like cholesterol probably will be helpful in maintaining the levels. The other recommendation is National Lipid Association recommendation. It's a patient-centric approach. Atherogenic cholesterol, non-HDL and LDL are primary targets. Non-HDL is listed because the panel actually favored this as the best parameter when compared to LDL. It's a more predictive than LDL cholesterol in observational studies and with regard to changes on treatment and levels in clinical trials. What is APOB? APOB is considered a secondary optional target of therapy, strongly associated with the ACVD event risk, more predictive power than LDL, but not consistently superior to non-HDL. <coughs> the recommendation for triglyceride, elevated triglyceride level is not a target for therapy per se, except when it is very high. If you are going to focus your attention on non-HDL cholesterol, that serves the purpose. There is no need to separately concentrate on triglyceride. That's a recommendation. If the triglycerides are more than 500 and around 1,000, you need to bring it down less than 500 by giving some drugs like fibrates or nicotinic acid or omega-3 fatty acids so that the patient will not get the problems of acute pancreatitis, not with the aim of reducing the cardiovascular event. Please remember that. The drug therapy is combination AAC and advised combination. Whereas ACC AHA guideline did not advise combination. Non-statin drugs, no role. Non-HDL, no. Concentrate only on atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk reduction. That's all. Don't chase the LDL. Don't go on doing the lipid parameters. It is maybe necessary for the patient to have an adherence. But don't go on doing the LDL cholesterol values to catch this sort of so-called goal that is not recommended by a American Association of American Heart Association and the ACC guidelines. Whereas the NLA says you need to put the patient on a second drug. 
when they are at a high risk. Maximally tolerated statin dose should be used before add-on therapy. If the patient has got a statin intolerance, what will you do? Switch over to another statin. Sometimes they do better. Or give it on alternate day. Or give it weekly twice or weekly once. That is also being experimented. Alternate drugs, they are also useful but may not be having a good relevant cardiovascular outcome data. Bilacid sequestrant like colisevelam, cholesterol absorption inhibitor like acetamide. I think some of you in this audience would have appreciated the publication of recent results on acetamide simvastatin combination that is the trial <coughs> which had gone to prove improve it trial, which had benefited patients with acute coronary syndrome. In fact, the acetamide combination was discouraged by many people, including cardiologists. In fact, I still remember when I was uh, asked to be there in a lipid conclave meeting at Delhi, there was a uh, uh, panel discussion where the moderator from Mumbai had asked me one question. Dr. Nursing, can you tell me whether acetamide can be used in conjunction with the statin? I said, yes, there is a place. I still continue to use it, but there is no data. But I strongly believe that in the future you will get a data because it produces LDL reduction. But the other cardiologist was asked to answer the same question. The other cardiologist, I don't want to name the cardiologist, he told, no, no, I will throw the acetamide in the dustbin. Then I asked me, what, to, what is your reply? I said, I will pick it up from the dustbin and try to use it for my patients. Now we have clear information that acetamide plus statin combination has done a reduction, has given a reduction in the cardiovascular outcome. Very, very important, particularly in people with acute coronary syndrome. It has also helped in people with the CKD. This combination with the statin has helped in people with CKD, which has <coughs> been published. So if you are able to reach the 70 milligrams, good. If you are not able to reach, at least you should aim for a 50% reduction of LDL or 50% reduction of non-HDL. How low you can probably go? Studies have clearly shown, even the Jupiter study has shown people, 23% of the people who were recruited in Jupiter study has shown a reduction of LDL less than 40 milligrams. So people who are reaching less than 50, 40 milligrams, there is no safety issues. JBS 2014 guidelines, Non-HDL cholesterol should be used in preference to LDL as a treatment of goal for lipid lowering therapy. NICE guidelines, 2014. If you are going to take care of patients for primary prevention and you are asking for a lipid profile, your lipid profile should contain one, total cholesterol, two, HDL cholesterol, three, triglycerides, that's all. LDL you need not do. That is the recommendation. LDL, there is no need. Last measurement is not required. So concentrate only on total cholesterol, HDL cholesterol. Total cholesterol minus HDL cholesterol, you get non-HDL cholesterol. Then do the triglyceride. That is enough. Do you require fasting? Not necessary. You can even submit your patient in a non-fasting state. The difference between a fasting and a non-fasting is only 0.2 millimoles in triglycerides. Proved. In Denmark, they stopped doing fasting samples. They stopped it. For the past five years, they have been doing non-fasting samples. They have gone to the extent of publishing a data saying that in no other branch of medicine it is being practiced. Even uh, diabetologists are depending mainly on the HbA1c rather than the fasting or the so-called PP blood sugar. So fasting sample not required even for lipid. You understand that? So that is a message that is being published now in lipid, in lipid uh, uh, particularly in the lipidology. ADA recommendation in the year 2015. What's the recommendation? If the patient has already got a coronary artery disease, give high dose statin plus lifestyle. Level of evidence, A. Can you combine it with any other drug? No. It is almost concurring with the views given by the ACCAHA. ADA says non-statin drugs may not be useful because we don't have data. I think they are also concurring with the views expressed by the ACCAHA. Now what about the 2015 AAC, American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists? Last month only it was published. They say you need to concentrate on LDL, you need to concentrate on non-HDL, 
you need to concentrate on apobi if required all those informations are available here look at the last one to lower ldl intensify statin add acetamide under combination with statin plus niacin to lower the non hdl intensify statin and then you can add omega 3 fatty acid or fibrate or niacin that's a recommendation please remember that to lower the apo b or the lipoprotein ldl particles the same recommendation so you need to remember how these guidelines are differing in their recommendations and we don't have guidelines in in fact the lipid association of india is now struggling to come out with some sort of recommendation and i am very much involved in that people have come and actually now they settled down in ITC Chola, I am going there. Tomorrow morning we have a one full day meeting, right from 9 to evening 6. We are going to have the discussion. We finished our meeting in Delhi, Mumbai, Calcutta, in Chennai. We are going to have it tomorrow. And a lot of data has been pouring in. We have involved endocrinologists, cardiologists, and physicians who are really oriented towards lipid management. We have involved them, and it's going to be a good sort of recommendation which we are planning to come out. In the recent analysis of a data of 68 studies, it is clearly seen that non-HDL was the best predictor of among all cholesterol measures, both for coronary artery disease and for strokes. Monitoring non-HDL cholesterol will provide a simple, practical tool for treatment decisions relating to lipid-related residual risk. This is the data that was published recently. LDL cholesterol reduction, non-HDL cholesterol reduction. Are you going to get the benefit even for cardiovascular risk? That's the message. Look at the last one here on this side. If you are reducing the LDL to levels of less than 50, and if you are at the same time reducing the levels of non-HDL to less than 75, the hazard ratio is 0.44 and 0.57, which is amazing, amazing, with regard to the cardiovascular events. So it's you can see in every parameter, with every reduction of LDL, you are comparing it with the non-HDL the reduction of cardiovascular events is seen with the, with the reduction in the hazard ratio. How will you manage non-HDL? Statins are the best drugs. If the patient is not able to bring down that, probably you can add acetamide. That's what we have already discussed. Can you use fibrates to start with? Don't use it when the levels are between 250 to 300. It's not going to be useful. Only the levels are going beyond 300, you may probably get some benefit. The message is simple, ladies and gentlemen. This is my last slide. Education is clearly needed to improve the implementation of guideline-based dyslipidemia management. We cannot frame guidelines because we don't have evidence here. If you want to frame guidelines, you require robust evidence. Where is the robust evidence? It comes from randomized control trials. Is it available in our country? No. Do you have epidemiological data? Yes. Are they, are they good enough to talk about it? you have scanty data. Please remember that. So we have some observational, we have some epidemiological data, but we don't have robust evidence coming from the randomized controlled trials. Our aim through Lipid Association is to synthesize all these guidelines, take that into consideration, see whether it can be fitting with the management for Indian patients. So the decision is US. On one side, I projected ACC, AHA guidelines and ADA guidelines, which are almost concurring with the views expressed. The other side, I have projected NLA, National Lipid Association, American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, and the International Atherosclerosis Society. I strongly favor, on the right side, I strongly favor National Lipid Association guidelines, which is almost suitable for our Indian patients also. So what is needed for Indians? I can only conclude by saying, Indians are specifically Asian Indian phenotype persons. They have an increased preponderance to develop overweight, obesity, constellation of risk factors ending in metabolic syndrome, higher levels of hypertension, higher levels and prevalence of diabetes, increased levels of high sensitive CRP and lower levels of adiponectin. Pro-inflammatory factors are high, pro-coagulant factors are high. Our psychosocial factors are also different. Our dyslipidemia is entirely different. High triglyceride, low HL, what I was trying to project. In, if that is a scenario in our country which is being witnessed by all of us, I think we need to have our own recommendation. That's what we are 
aiming through Leopard Association of India. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for patient listening. Thank you very much, sir, for giving us a very clear-cut message, evidence-based message. Thank you very much, sir. The floor is open for discussion. Any questions? Any questions? Anybody? Okay, in the absence of any question, let me now request Dr. Santanam. You have a question? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, one minute. Any role for lipoglin? Don't ask me the trade name, it is a seroglitazor. See, yeah, okay. Seroglitazor is a PPR alpha gamma agonist. The PPR gamma agonist, you know, pioglitazone. The PPR alpha agonist, you know, fibrates. This is on this end, this is the other end. In between, you have one molecule, that is seroglitazor, with more of alpha activity, less of gamma activity. So that is seroglitazor. Of course, the previous glitazors which were tried in phase three trials have failed to show any sort of benefit. More problems were encountered, they stopped. Now the seroglitazor has gone through all these phase studies and has been introduced into the Indian market. It's found to be very good in reducing the triglyceride levels in people, particularly with the diabetes and primary hypertriglyceridemia. It not only reduces the triglyceride, but also improves the HbA1c levels and brings down the blood sugar fasting as well as postprandial. Seems to be a good drug as far as the experience is concerned in a very short period of mine as well as, of course, with all of your experience. And uh, I'm sure probably this molecule will also fit in very well in those people in whom you are struggling to bring down the triglycerides. Assessment of familiar triglyceride. Suppose the triglyceride level is about 500, some 600. How to fix it is familial or some other factors operating? Familial hypertriglyceridemia, usually you don't get 500. It will be more than 1,000, 2,000. Even in patients with the diabetes also, when they have an uncontrolled problems, I have seen my own patients, type 2, or even type 1 patients also, they have very abnormal levels of triglyceride. I have seen even 3,000, 3,500 also triglyceride. All that you should do is to control the sugar properly. Don't be in a hurry to bring down the triglyceride. Try to control the sugar as early as possible with your insulin or something. You know, the glucotoxicity will come down naturally. The lipotoxicity will also come down simultaneously. At the end of three weeks or four weeks, you will be surprised to see the triglyceride level is nearly about 300 or 250. After that, probably you can think about adding some drugs if you really feel that uh, cardiovascular risk can be reduced. To the purely level. Huh? The level level of TGL yeah. is going to give a clue on familial or non-familial. No. About so thousand. Suppose the about patient those. is not a diabetic and the patient is found to have very abnormal levels of triglyceride, you need to probably think in terms of primary hypertriglyceridemia. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Sir, which statin is preferred, sir, atorvastatin or rosuvastatin? That's a very difficult question to be answered, but I can only tell you as per the evidence available today, I had used the good old uh, drugs like uh, simvastatin, then we have switched over to atorvastatin, and mostly we are now using the rosuvastatin. Atorvastatin is a drug that was used in a number of trials, particularly in acute coronary syndrome, it is a drug of choice. Now we have not come out from the acute coronary syndrome prescription with, with uh, atorvastatin to rosuvastatin. Though some evidence is now pouring in to say rosuva is also better. But if you ask me if the LDL level is very high, you need to give a good drug to bring down the LDL because the risk is very high in that individual. Probably I will use rosuvastatin to bring down the LDL as early as possible. If the LDL levels is not very high and the fellow is not having a very high risk, probably you can put him on an atorvastatin. In patients in whom you are seeing a problem of acute coronary syndrome, the, the high dose of atorvastatin, probably 80 milligram will help at this situation, though the results are also for the rosua, but it is very scanty. Sir, can we give rosuvastatin as a primary prevention in all diabetic patients, sir, even though their lipids are at a normal level? Rosuvastatin. Yes, sir, at a lower doses. See, the primary prevention for uh, people with diabetes can you give rosuvastatin? See, the problem is that you, you recollect one trial called COR study. 
which had used only 10 mg of atorvastatin in people with diabetes and they had shown a cardiovascular benefit. This trial was prematurely stopped at the end of 3.4 years which had shown enormous amount of benefit in people with diabetes, only 10 mg of atorvastatin. Whereas in Jupiter study, no patients with the diabetes were recruited in this study, but non-diabetic patients were tend to develop the problem of diabetes after starting 20 mg of rosuvastatin. Nearly about 9.8% of the patients developed diabetes. So new onset diabetes is a big issue that was raised after the publication of Jupiter study. It was not the new information, even Voskov's, ASCOP study had indicated that there is a tendency for these patients to develop diabetes of starting statin. But if you ask me, the meta-analysis which was done recently and published clearly has shown that the amount of benefit that you are going to get in people with the diabetes is much more when compared to the adverse effect of developing a new onset diabetes in a non-diabetic. So, if you are lucky to treat 255 patients for the next five years with a statin, you will get only one patient with a diabetes, but you will save 5.4 lives from coronary artery disease. Which one you want? So the beneficial effects are much more than pushing these patients for diabetes. I would ra rather prefer to use statin, and I will not hesitate to use this particular statin. Let me now request Dr. Santana to present this photograph to the speaker. Please give him a <laughs> big hand. Yeah, so nice. <coughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Photographer. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.